Good morning. I'd uh, like to share the following with you that um, the call to worship this morning spoke to me as a family historian and um, in part to refresh your memory, it reads, I will speak parables and proverbs and the stories handed down from generation to generation. We will not hide them from our children, but tell all generations of the glorious deeds and might and wonders done by our God. Let me clarify what qualifies as the glorious deeds and might of our God. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. That's one of the scriptures that supports the saying that you are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mother Teresa um, once put it another way. She said, we are all pencils in the hand of, the, of God, writing love letters to the world. So following the theme of prepare for the Lord, I want to talk about some of those love letters to the world. And I'll start with a very personal note. My mother passed away in 1979 uh, when I was just 31 years old. As the official family historian, I inherited boxes of letters and journals, photos and other items that my mother had accumulated over the years. My mother, Lucille, always had stories to tell of our ancestors and in short, and shortly before her death in July, I had an opportunity to sit and ask her questions. Um, and uh, she told me stories that previously, as the saying goes, had went in one ear and out the other. I learned that she had been the unofficial family historian and in turn her mother, my grandmother Edna Barker, was her generation's archivist of, of family stories. That's all by way of explaining why I inherited 10 to 12 boxes of materials that have been in my garage for 41 years. So 10 years ago after retirement, probably due to equally to the pandemic and to my uh, wife's specific request, I tackled those boxes. In the last few months, I've been scanning photos and reading old letters, sharing their contents and scattering uh, mementos among family members. Among all the items, I rediscovered that my mother had started a newsletter called The Grapevine for an unofficial, loosely knit group called the Sparrows Club. It was her mission by mail. The typed and mini mimeographed letter or newsletter um, started in the spring of 1967. The Grapevine newsletter reprinted letters between my mother and folks who were disabled or shut in. I'm not sure how many issues there were or even how mother started finding subscribers, but she was a writer and an author in the Saints, uh, having contributed articles to the Saints Herald and letters to the editor in the Ladies Home Journal. She connected with people through her correspondence. My mother suffered from asthma and emphysema as well as a, a weakened heart. So she had much in common with her correspondence. She didn't drive, but was very active in the local congregation, but always dependent on my father to drive her around. The Sparrows Club had no dues, no subscription fee, but was supported out of her house household money plus small contributions of stamps and cash from readers. But it was her missionary effort. In the grapevine, mom included letters from club members and included also a hobbies, handicrafts and household pets column and a hymn corner that listed readers favorite hymn lyrics such as, this is my father's world and what a friend we have in Jesus. Through the hymn corner, I learned that my father's favorite hymn was the battle hymn of the Republic that begins, my eyes, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Each of those hymns I heard as a child, either on our old uh, 35 RPM Victrola, you can know what that is, or sung in the morning as my mother did chores around the house. 
One published letter was from an 82 year old widow who had been surprised on her birthday with a gathering of children and grandchildren. Another was from a mother who'd, whose grown and disabled daughter was still under her care. Other, words, other letters were from folks obviously separated from family who found friendship through the grapevine, each sharing their life stories. One woman sent a list of Bible uh, verses in which she found comfort. The list was extensive and included a number of Bible verses for daily strength and daily needs. Uh, I'd like to share with you just a few of those. When you can't go to sleep, Psalm 4. And a section of that reads, in peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. If challenged by opposing forces, uh, the list included Ephesians 6, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And another one, when everything seems to go from bad to worse, it referenced Hebrews 13. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And further in that scripture, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Another entry was from Anne, a teacher and later a medical stenographer. Due to serious or severe diabetes, she had lost her sight and her employment. She was about to undergo surgery that would remove a, one of her legs. Anne wrote, I have been the victim of loneliness and had hardly dared hope anymore, so I can imagine how others feel. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to take part in your Sparrows Club. Anne shared a poem she wrote titled, Is It Worth It? And I'd like to share that with you. Is it worth it? We ask as we struggle each day to keep trying to live in a body with physical limits, of con limits confining. When the spirit inside longs to roam and to soar and be free, to dive and explore to the depths of mortality. Is it worth it, we ask, when the body is racked with such pain? And we're told that we have to be brave, that we must not complain. When in desperate hours, the taste of death's sting would be sweet as compared to arising each morning, our problems to meet. Is it worth it? We cry out when that demon called fear takes control and tries to destroy our body, our mind, and our soul. Then, forsaken by God and by man, we cry out in the night, God, give me a reason to want to go on without sight. Is it worth it? I ask as I stepped out in the morning so fair and felt warm sun on my face and the wind in my hair and heard the bird's song and smelled the sweet fragrance of spring to live for such moments as these, life is everything. Life is worth everything. Then the meaning of life rings out clear and true in my mind. Although my windows are shattered, in some ways I will never be blind. To the beauty and joy and richness of life I go on to bow down to God's will. He will guide me, I am never alone. In another newsletter, Mom quoted, but altered slightly the first stanza of a poem by Edwin Markham, an American poet who lived from 1852 to 1940. There is a destiny that makes us kindred. None goes his way alone. All that we send into the lives of others comes back onto our own. I think that's an early 20th century way of saying what goes around comes around. Why have I spent so much time talking about the grapevine? After all, you won't find it on anyone's bookshelf or in any archives. I don't even have a complete issue, let alone a complete set, just bits and pieces. But it was one small project that reached a small group of people who needed to know they were not alone. They told their stories. They shared their fears, concerns, and victories with a small group of pen pals through the newsletter. 
its subscription list grew as one shared a copy with a friend and that friend shared with yet another friend. Today's theme is prepare for the Lord. At times, I think we prepare best by the simple ministry of presence, being there for those who need us to listen. My mother never went to foreign lands as a missionary. She passed away before women were ordained into the priesthood in our church. She never drove. And as she approached the end of her life, she was confined mainly to an easy chair or walked slowly with a cane, struggling for breath. <clears throat> but she knew how to send cards and letters and how to reach out to the lonely and brokenhearted, even from a distance. To prepare for the Lord, our ministry doesn't need to be grand and monumental. We serve best in the place we find ourselves planted using the talents we have. Each serves best when we provide our best service for the time and place we find ourselves. I'll end with one more story. The names and places have been changed to protect the innocent. A young woman, we'll call her Mary Ellen, went shopping in Walmart late one evening and headed to the checkout line. She found herself behind a young man with a cartload of merchandise, food, slacks, a white shirt and tie. He was obviously having trouble in the self-service line. His credit card kept being rejected. After several attempts, a Walmart employee came over to assist. Evidently, the credit card company was refusing the charge because the young man was from several states away. He explained that he just arrived in Kansas City, having driven all night and was expected at his new job in the morning. In addition to food, he needed to purchase work clothes for the, next, for the next morning. He had lost his previous job due to cutbacks caused by COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. And unfortunately had failed to notify the credit card company of his move. When it was clear that the, church, the clerk was unable to help, Mary Ellen stepped forward and offered to use her credit card and cover the $184 bill. With tears in his eyes, the young man thanked her and promised to pay back the amount. Mary Ellen declined, declined the offer, saying it was a gift and covered the bill. Other people in Walmart had overheard the conversation and wondered why Mary Ellen had covered a complete stranger's bill. The story reminds me of a line from the mission prayer, God, where will your spirit lead today? Help me be fully awake and ready to respond. Mary Ellen had a family of her own to care for. She didn't really have the money to spare, but thought that somehow God would provide. God did provide, but that's another story. More than anything else, Mary Ellen felt she had been placed in the right place at the right time and needed to respond. As you prepare for the Lord, remember that each small deed of kindness lights a candle in the dark world. Each light is multiplied and can illuminate the place and time in which we live. It reminds me of the wise virgins found in the parable in Matthew 25 who kept their lights burning. So keep your lights trimmed and burning.